Okay, so you should just be able to see, um, not my slideshow yet, but the PowerPoint, yeah? Brilliant, thumbs up, that's what I like. Right, so so I've come along to this, um, and I wouldn't, I, I, I'm kind of aware that I'm coming to a meeting of anarchist educators, and would I class myself as an anarchist educator? I've always classed myself as an educator who tries to do my own thing, and actively resist things that I don't think are right. Um, and I've, I've been teaching in education now for 30 years, and I worked out a long time ago that most of the time people aren't taking an awful lot of notice of what I'm doing. So if I follow the rules, sometimes the rest of the time I can pretty much do what I want. So um, I decided a few years ago that I was going to do my PhD with Sunderland University. And my PhD is uh, it's around folk schools and folk school education, which was um, why it was interesting that some people at this meeting are from Scandinavia. Um, and what I've been doing over the last three years and what I'm doing at this very moment is that I spend time drinking coffee and talking to folk school teachers from different countries around the world to find out what their, their thinking is on education. And one of the things that drew me to the folk schools in the first place was um, their resistance to standardization, which was something that really appealed to me. Um, but it was while talking to these educators that I, I, well, it's really a mix of a couple of things. The first thing is that I actually ended up talking to a folk school teacher who considered themselves to be an anarchist. Um, but also I've always been a member of the Socialist Party and I was at um, a meeting maybe, gosh, maybe about eight months ago and somebody mentions People, people started talking about the poll tax riots in London, and then somebody went on to crit criticise um, anarchist um, party members that were at that for the, the trouble that they perceived that they caused. And then somebody put them straight and said that you, you need to start reading about anarchist politics because there's um, a lot to it. And I thought, well, actually, I don't know much about anarchist politics. I'm going to read up myself. So um, that, that combination of those things led me to um, looking on Twitter, finding different um, social media groups. And I saw the invite to talk at this and I thought, hey, right, I'll give it a go. Um, and then soon after that, so I'm gonna move on to slideshow now. I am gonna pause at certain points because I'm, I'm interested to know what people think. Um, I'm gonna go to slideshow. Should from beginning right. So I was in a classroom recently, and having read a bit about anarchist politics and thinking, yeah, I'm I'm very much aligned with what I'm reading. I walked into a classroom, saw on the wall, said anarchy, a condition of lawlessness brought about by the absence of a government. And I thought it's really misrepresented and the vast majority of people don't actually understand anything about anarchist politics at all. So that combination of all of those things. So, um, like I said, I've been in education for a long time and lots of the things that I've began to read that people considered to be anarchist education, I wasn't interested in. So I'll, I'll put up three things that this talk isn't about. Um, the first thing is um, free choice, because I read a lot of things around people saying that, you know, I'm offering anarchist ed education and the way that I do that is that I give free choice. And to me, to me that's great, but it's, it's not really what this was my, my own research is about. Also, I saw, I saw quite a lot of people saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a good anarchist educator because I teach in a maybe a, a very creative kind of way. I do things differently. And then they want to label it as something. And they might say, oh, you know, it's like I'm an anarchist educator because I'm doing something different. So I've ignored that. 
Um, and the other thing, and this was the hardest thing, because I work, most of the people I work with are refugees or unemployed people, but la largely people from um, a lower socioeconomic background. And lots of what I was reading when I was digging into anarchist education was what I would call middle class choices. So it was you, you could access greater freedom of choice. You can you can be apart from the state system if you can pay for it. So really, what my mind wasn't thinking around any of those three lines. What I would say is that. I don't know whether anybody has come across this book yet. It's called Dispossessed. I was looking for something that was considered to be anarchist fiction, but I really like the quote. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything to say that I'm right. This is just me sitting on my hill saying the way that I see it. Um, and it's a few other people that I've spoken to sitting on, <laughs> sitting on their hills saying what they happen to see. It's just like our version of what we think is the truth. So... Um, I found myself maybe about three months ago, sitting on Zoom, just like this, talking to a Finnish folk education tutor. Um, they wouldn't call themselves that at all. And they were in their cabin off in the north of Finland. And I was sitting here in not so sunny Newcastle upon time. And they were telling me about what they were doing, which was not part of a traditional folk school, but a traditional folk school that approached the traditional folk school and said, look, I've been living this sustainable life. I think it would be good to teach other people about it. So I was looking for people on the fringes of folk schools. And I was struck by some of the things that they were saying because they, they changed my thinking on not only folk schools, but also what I might consider anarchist education but what I'm interested in is do other anarchist educators see what I see? Or am I completely wrong? So I'll, I'll put up one quote, but I'm going to tell you some of the things that we spoke about, which I thought were interesting. Um, I'll just leave that, leave that quote up. So, so this was from the folk school teacher. Now, you need to know a little bit about this person. Basically, what they decided to do between, I can't remember the exact number of years, between 20 and 30 years ago, was to remove themselves as much as they possibly could do from society. They wanted to lead a life using as little money as possible. And I know that for lots of those years, they managed to survive on the equivalent of about £10 a year. And everything else, they've either grown or hunted or chopped down or built. And that's what they managed to do for decades, largely removed from society. And their argument was that um, if I'm using money, I am tied into society. And in his anarchist way of thinking is that if I want to be truly independent, I need to be able to prove that I can be truly independent from almost everything in society. So that's how we chose to live, live this sustainable life. Um, because in his thinking that then I can decide how much of a part I want to play in society if I know that I can remove myself from it. And then, you know, what he argued to me was that, yes, he does engage with society sometimes, he does go into a local village or town sometimes, but it's his choice and he does it when he wants to. So I, I thought that that was really interesting in terms of how we educate people, because a, a lot of what I do in adult education is about book learning. It's about knowledge learning in terms of things that are in people's heads. And his argument was that education should give people skills to be able to survive, remove from society. Um, and that learning was far more, well, to him was less about skills and knowledge and it was more to do with the processes that you need to be able to carry out to do that. But he was also doing other really interesting things. 
like um, working out ways to preserve berries. And his works, he's written almost this whole book that involves turning jars of berries upside down, or timed in a particular way so that yeah, for the first week you turn them every day and then for the second week you turn them every single day and then he worked out by himself this whole method of preserving berries so that he needed the least number of things and the least resources to make it happen and then by trial and error he made it happen which i thought was a great learning activity in itself but this is how he's chosen to lead his life in the wild almost as like a like a sustainable scientist but now he's teaching other people those things. But the other thing that he argued was that I can't give people free choice on the things that I'm teaching them. Because in reality, if you keep on choosing to do things and trying things out, if, if you're in the wilds of Finland, at some point, if you are growing your crops in the wrong way, you will have no food and you will die. So, you can't go down the line of like mass experimentation all of the time because there are specific things that you just have to tell people what to do. It's not, you know, once people are bought into it, it's not a choice thing. It is, you need to do it like this or otherwise it's going to fail. So that was like the first thought that came to me was that education should equip us to live a sustainable and independent life, which if that's the case, has repercussions on how you would choose to build a curriculum of learning if that's what you were aiming at. Um, the other thing that he spoke about was the inspiration from a book that some people might have read called Walden. And he, he, he signposted me to this quote, which I'll leave up on the screen just for a moment. What this quote made me do is reflect on, I've learned an awful lot of things at school and forgotten most of them. I spent five years learning German and now I can speak about 30 words. I've, I think I've probably wasted most of those five years when I was in school, when I could have been doing something else. And what if what I'd been learning were things that genuinely would be useful to me in this kind of scenario? A scenario where if I did actually lose everything, would I be able to make my way in the world? Because if I can make my way in the world in that way, then am I not truly independent? So then the question to me was, what do we actually need to know? So I'm just going to, before I move on, Back to this point. Okay, sorry, just have to take a pause there. Right, so I'm going to move on. I work in adult education in the UK. I work for a local authority provider. Most of our funding comes from getting people into work. That's, that's, that's a big part of what we're doing is, and, and, and almost always I won't receive funding unless I can prove that I'm making people more employable. So my thinking also is that if I walk into my workplace and say, yes, I want to put some anarchist education principles into practice, then actually lots of people listen to what I say in my workplace, but they would say, but you know, how, you know, how is this preparing people for the world to work? So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that other people here have read um, some of Emma Goldman's work, but I was struck by this particular quote. I'll just leave it on the screen for a moment. Now, as I said at the beginning, what I do is I talk to folk school teachers and it just so happened that I'd read this and in reading it, um, 
I, I thought, okay, what we do an awful lot of the time is we, we teach people things like employability skills, but we very rarely actually teach people um, craft kind of skills. And I was reflecting on how little of this, I've got three teenage children and how little of what they do at school prepares them for any kind of craft work. Um, and I'll give you one example because my son is busy there making toast at the minute. So I can actually talk about him and, um, and he can grimace is that he, he actually told me that he would like to do things that involve making things at school at the age of um, 14, which is not an unreasonable thing to want to do in an education system. So um, he decided to sign up for design and technology. And then about six months later, he came home and said that design and technology was a fraud because you didn't actually make anything. What you did was you, you talked about making things, you drew things out that you might make, um, you wrote essays about the things that you were make, you're gonna make. And if you were really lucky at the end, you might actually make something. So that was my next um, thought that was in my head as I was moving through talking to different people, was that how, if, if we wanna get anarchist education right and we want to make people truly independent, we, we also need to think about how in education we let people learn the skills to be able to learn a trade that can make them independent. So I ended up talking to, and I'm moving around my Scandinavian countries here. I didn't realize those people were gonna be from Scandinavia here tonight. And I spoke to somebody in Denmark, who's actually kind of quite a good friend now. And what they do is they work in a folk high school that's all about design. And this is what they said. I'm leaving that quote up on the screen. I'm forcing people to read. Anyway, the, 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 um, the argument of this folk school teacher was that almost everything that we do now is head learning and so little of what we do is doing learning. Now, I, I do know this in that I come across many adults that if I give them a pair of scissors um, in, at our provider and we say, right, can you cut something out? I would comfortably say that at least half the people in the room would struggle to use a pair of scissors because these are just not the skills that are taught an awful lot of the time. And this tutor's argument, I can't use the names at the minute because they're, because they're part of the research, was that um, we, we need to get back to actually doing rather than head and talking. So, I'm gonna flick back through because I'm gonna summarize before getting to my final part was that. So my, my thought number one, this, I mean, these are all thoughts inspired by people, but the main reason why I'm here because I'm interested to know what other people think is that it's the curriculum for survival to be, you know, to be able to live independently from society to then be able to join in with society on your own terms. It is a curriculum where the things that you learn, you actually truly know are going to be useful to you. And you have some choice in that. But it's also a curriculum that doesn't deny that people need to work. But we seem to have moved from a society where everything is about head knowledge rather than like craft hands on knowledge. Yet, like I, I, know, I know many, many, many people who don't learn any of the skills of making things until they leave school, which seems to make no sense at all. That then led me to Denmark to talking to a folk school teacher there 
who says that we've moved far too much towards the head and it needs to be far more about the doing. So the premise of my, um, I suppose my argument, but I'm interested to know how the audience see this in terms of like, any kind of like, anarchist edu educational thinking on what curriculum should be, is that it should be a hands-on curriculum that's for life, because by having a hands-on curriculum that's a survival curriculum, that leads to a different kind of independence and the whole line of the thinking is that that's one thing being able to think in anarchist terms within a society yet still do most of the things that society is asking you to do and truly being able to have the skills and the knowledge to be able to remove yourself from society to live on your own terms And that leads to open for questions or discussion. Or quiet. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. I think this was very interesting. So if I may, um, I liked very much that you uh, touched several topics that are always kind of, um, well, touchy <laughs> among anarchist educators. I don't know how to call it, but anyway, um, the first one uh, is this you mentioned, uh, I hope it's the right word in English, is directivity or guiding. You said that if you give, uh, open choices and freedom sometimes they not necessarily will choose what they need to learn. And this is a pretty essential discussion in anarchist pedagogies because it's always this balance. Uh, and I think sometimes that we have to guide them uh, because we they are growing up in these societies that are so theoretical in many ways that it's not for sure that they know what to choose, right? So guidance, I think uh, it's necessary. Um, and what strikes me that we still, in anarchist pedagogies, uh, we still talk about the goal of being independent. And being in this, uh, <laughs> in Norway, <laughs> that it's very individualistic, and you have given examples both from Finland and, and Denmark that are pretty close in, in culturally speaking, Finland not that much, but the Denmark absolutely does. Um, I've, lately I've been thinking that instead of thinking of independence as a goal, I think it should be interdependency, right? Because uh, if we are able to create communities, we have to be aware of the other principle in anarchy that is the mutual aid, right? That means that of course we do stuff together and we support each other. And then I think this independence goal, I, I don't think it's that healthy, but I, you know, I also work with young adults at the university and I see how, how it strikes that they are not able of cooperating when we ask them to, right? Because they are so they are being so trained into do things for themselves. And we see then out in society, what happened now under the pandemic, that people are not used to be interdependent because they, we have to manage everything on our own. And I think this is also a, a, an interesting part of it. Um, and just to finish, um, I very much agree with what you presented at the end, that education, generally speaking, has become very theoretical, right? I mean, I'm, what the Danish uh, teacher said, this is, we hear this often. So actually, of course, it's quite a 
contradiction if we think that the idea of anarchist pedagogies that education has to be holistic. And right now it's not. I mean, I don't know in other territories, but at least here in Norway, it's, uh, I'm saying, yeah, pretty similar to Denmark. They don't do anything with their hands. They are not used to it. Um, and of course we should take that back. This, there are some debates uh, at least going on here, but absolutely it's, it, it's a problem this much theory, right? They cannot sew a button. They, I mean, there's a lot of basic things they can do actually to be in a community even, right? So that's, those were my thoughts. And I, I think it's, the presentation was great actually to put the thoughts <laughs> uh, yeah, in action. So thank you. No, but thank you. Can I say a couple of things too, though? That, that, um... First off is that um, like, these are thoughts. So, so this is, these are different thoughts that have come from my own research that aren't, aren't necessarily directly linked to the research, but they're just things that have come up that have got me thinking. And then what I was really interested in is that, okay, anarchist education, what people who are new to anarchist education would say to me was what does that look like how do you do that and I really struggled to find anything that was a coherent picture that you could describe and explain to somebody else that if you did this 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 you would have you'd have something that you like a model that you could to a certain extent follow because quite often the model that I saw with things that people could mostly say were part of something else. So that's why I said that like, free choice. Well, lots of places include an element of free choice. So what I was really battling with and struggling was with almost like an identity that I could understand and then I could explain to other people. But I think it's interesting what you say about in Scandinavia, a very individualistic, because as part of my research, I've spoken to folk school teachers in India, Tanzania, America. And the ones in Scandinavia are very much about building personal growth, the individual. But as soon as you move away from Western Europe, Scandinavia, people begin to talk differently and they will talk about the importance of doing and they'll talk about the importance of talking as opposed to writing things down but what they all say as soon as you move out of Europe is that actually community is more important and that yes people need to learn the skills to be independent but they need the skills to be able to contribute to the local society and also really interestingly they don't normally talk about the national society, they talk about the immediate society within that village or that town or that area. So it's really, I can't think of the word, but it's that they almost dismiss. So I was talking to somebody from India last week and I was talking to them about, we have this thing here called British values. And I was saying, do you, do you have to do anything on um, Indian national identity? And he said, that's not important. What's important is our community. So what, what we do is that we want to teach people hands-on skills that they can use in our community to make our community strong. So, um, yeah, it's like really, it's, it's an interesting point that, yeah, in Scandinavia, the thing that I pick up all of the time is about the individual. <laughs> so, yeah. So like I said at the beginning anyway, I, I didn't come along saying I'm an expert on the anarchist um, pedagogies because I'm really not. I've just discovered lots of things and I'm interested to know what other people think. I see that Katie's raised a hand. Oh, thanks. This was like, yeah, I re really enjoyed it. I don't know a lot about folk school as well, so it's always really interesting to hear, hear more about kind of, yeah, that folk school as a practice. I think one of the things that I found really helpful, like responding to a couple of points, that you've raised when I've thought about anarchist education and that point around there being a blueprint. Like, I, um, 
is that I find it really helpful to frame kind of anarchist education as a way of resisting kind of what's happening. Therefore, it kind of continually changes. So there isn't a blueprint because it's always in opposition to whatever is, is kind of happening. I think that's it's a helpful reminder when you're trying to find like an instructional kind of step by step guide and, and then recognizing that that probably doesn't exist because it's all so contextual. Um, but I think like one of the, you know, going back to that community point and like my, my my background is FE, particularly whether it's both kind of like adult education and um, 16 to 19 kind of technical. Um, and I think one of the things that was really interesting, particularly during the pandemic, was seeing how colleges like FE, further education, technical colleges, responded in a mutual aid kind of way in their communities and really situated what they were doing with the curriculum as a way of, of furthering that kind of mutual aid practice. So um, at the time I was researching, um, students kind of making scrubs and doing kind of direct like scrub and PPE um, manufacturing to then give over to their local community but doing that as part of their um, their like fashion and pattern cutting course or people taking home 3D printers to make stuff or co whole colleges letting out their catering facilities to to feed the community. Um, I think there's really interesting examples of where we can see really practical applied ideas of anarchist pedagogy in response to the pandemic. I don't think people who took part in it probably regard it as, regard themselves as anarchists, but I think the practice very much was a practice of solidarity. Um, I think there's some really interesting kind of things to draw on, particularly in that, that vocational space. Katie, can I just add something onto that point? Because we both, we both work in a, a similar system that I've, I've I think there's something in the fact that we're so constrained by processes, systems, traditions, and I, I, I quite often see my job as questioning those processes, those systems, um, to challenge the systems that we create, because a lot of the time we've created them <laughs> internally. I don't actually, quite often, I don't think that they're imposed from the outside. I think that we just make these these systems and processes and then we just leave them and we don't challenge them so maybe you know maybe there's something in that that you know anarchist pedagogy is about challenging or, or, or keeping on re-evaluating those systems and processes rather than just rigidly sticking to them yeah absolutely um there was another hand that went up yeah. and went down <laughs> I, I have a, a small oh, comment. Time. Yeah. Um, Gary, did you look at all at uh, integral education? No. So uh, this might be useful to you. Uh, it's, 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 you know, we're, we're, it's, it's a 20th, it's an early 20th century uh, paradigm. Paul Rabin is a good, is a really good example of that in, in France. Um, it's, it's a, it's a way to think of education as, as both community and an individual um, um, uh, uh, development of skills. And it's, and it's, it's an idea that education should be holistic in the sense that you both learn the skill and also attach that skill to theories and to, and to philosophy and to history and to other more theoretical fields of study. And, and by, create, by, by, by helping um, learners do both things, advance themselves, um, in, in say handwork and also intellectual work, you're creating a, a, a community of learners who work together and who, who, who act in mutual aid towards one another. And so you do the learning together, you do the working together and you, and, and, and you combine those different aspects in a way that creates a community that is self-sufficient in itself. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, th I think it's worth a shot for you to maybe read a little bit about it might it might be what you're might be at least close to what you're thinking of do you know your time i'm already interested um <laughs> is, is, it, is it called integral education yes yes at least the the yeah the english of this uh nicole who is one of the members of our of our um uh, coordinating committee um goes by a uh, nerd teacher on twitter that did some really impressive work on that so um uh i, I would highly recommend like that's a good place to start i think really yeah I've, I've, I've got it noted and down and um ready to go on that one so thank you yeah
I think Bruno's got his hand up. Yeah, uh, you were mentioning uh, Finland. Did you get to research or seen something else from Finland other than these folk studies from this person you you mentioned? I, I do know other bits and pieces about education in Finland because um, I've been in contact with a few people, um, not in folk schools, but in universities. Um, and I, I've, I've like, spoken to people at um, Citra, S I T R A, which is um, they're doing a build on project. So, so, so bits and pieces, but not in any great depth because. I've I've got my like ten conversations. I'm I'm trying to compare just those one that one conversation from each country. But I'd be interested to know more. Okay. No, I was just wondering if if you saw more of the Finnish education system. What was your opinion connected with these ideas you were talking about? Well, all, all I know is that it's almost impossible to get um, a trip to Finland to look at the education system because you have to book ages in advance and pay money because. It seems like the whole world wants to go to Finland to see the Finnish education system. If you want to listen the official stories, yes, but there are other uh, options. Yeah. yeah, that seems to be the official story on it, doesn't it? But I, but I also know that you don't supposedly have private education, which um, is yeah, is is good in my book, <laughs> or as close to it as possible. Okay, I'm, t I'm just hoping the sun's made their um, tea in the kitchen by now. I have a question. Um, since you presented what you've been doing until now, um, in your practice, uh, how do you m motivate the students to get engaged in creating their own curriculum? Um, do you know, and um, I mean, you know, I'm one of two English people here. The way that the, um, the the curriculum is taught mostly in adult education in the UK is that um, they work towards a qualification and then the tutor will tell them this is what you're supposed to learn on this course. But I, um, I first started in primary schools, so I, I taught very young children. And my way of working is always that people learn what they want to learn better. So I start every course, yeah, every course by asking, you know, like say for instance, the course is on, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of a good example here, watercolor painting, because I'm teaching watercolor painting at the minute. Um, what, what, what would you like to do? Yeah, or what questions have you got? So if we were, I don't know, we were learning about the history of Russia, which is like very, you know, in the news at the moment, it would be, okay, what, what do you want to find out? And then those questions would get pinned up. And then every activity would be suggested by the learners for them to find out the answers to those questions. Because the thinking is, it's the questions that the learners have got that matter, not what I want to teach them. And actually, you know, sometimes people look at me and say, really? But what I always say to them, and you know, it does work, is that nearly always the questions that they want to answer are the things that they've got to learn anyway. <laughs> so it's there's a certain kind of like psychology to it as well. Um, and well, when I first started where I'm working at the minute, nobody did that at all. But I'm lucky enough that I do manage a small team of people. So I suggested them to, they did this and now they won't do anything different. So I, I suppose I'm, it's like, you know, I wouldn't say that that's anarchist pedag pedagogy. I would say that that's person-centered, um, that's person-centered approach um, to learning. But 
I, I would approach everything with the, with the premise that it's not what I want to teach them, it's what they want to learn that matters. So, and I think it works in every subject. Right. Thank you. And yes, I'm, uh, I think we are all who are um, working or, you know, in this uh, structured state based or formal uh, centers, we know how constricted it is. I mean, though, though we would love to perhaps methodologically speaking do things in another way is actually difficult for what you said, right? There's qualifications, there's certain measurements you have to reach. And that, that makes, I mean, that actually, as educators, I feel that limits us in many ways, right? At least when I teach, I feel that I would love to do a lot of things and give give them the chance. To, I mean, of course, this is students at university, but you know, it would be nice to to say to tell them that they could choose their own style of being and stuff like that. But I know we don't have the time. And if I say that, I'm sure they would faint altogether because they have never done that, <laughs> right? So, um, but I, I think it's interesting uh, how we try to navigate in these constrictions, this, uh, with all these rules and all these limits, I think. Do you know what's interesting as well is that, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely sitting in this room, talking to people who are thinking along similar lines. But what, my, my first idea was that I want to talk to some anarchist educators working with adults. Whoa, was that a hard thing to achieve? Like, like where do you start? And, you know, eventually I found this group but beyond this group, um, I contacted somebody who's written books, who was a university lecturer and written on anarchism. And I contacted them and they said, well, actually, I don't really know. I can give you a couple of leads, but I don't really know people who are doing it with adults, you know, with adults. So then they put me onto another lecturer who I had a conversation with and they said, oh, do you know, I feel really bad because, I believe in this stuff and I want to do it, but actually I'm so constrained that I don't really feel like I'm living out what I believe in. And it was a real tough gig to try and find people <laughs> to talk to. So I ended up talking to the, you know, the guy in Finland just purely by exploring and eventually almost by chance. And then there was somebody else in this country who didn't want to talk to me at all. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was tricky. So how do you how do you spread an idea? Yeah, it's no easy thing. It's especially when you're walking into classrooms and it's got little signs to do with anarchism that basically say, yeah, anarchism is chaos. That's what it is. You know, it's yeah. Okay, I've got nobody else with any more questions. But you know what, I, I see it as a positive that people have asked some questions. Because <laughs> if nobody had said anything, that would have been hard. <laughs> that would have been hard. So thank you for asking some questions and making some contributions as well. Thank you, Etan. I'll be reading it. Bruno, I've got some food for thought. Oh, sorry, I thought you got some food. <laughs> I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you what food you got. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Tim. Nice. 
what I have realised that if this is being recorded, people will see it with me just laughing at my own jokes, which <laughs> which is not good. <laughs> we stop recording now. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Take care. Good evening.